response? I, I think you need you need both. I mean, the Tesla case is a, is a good is a good example. Um, you need you need the people who are backing businesses like this with a crazy idea. Nobody knows what coming comes out of it. Um, but if you look at the environmental impact, I know the people that run the Tesla shop in Munich quite well. Uh, to date, they sold 50 cars in, in Munich. So what's the environmental impact in Munich? But indirectly, I mean, the whole car industry, you have BMW in Munich, they're under pressure. They launched the i3, they launched the i8. Um, they see that the end consumer is caring about the environmental impact. They streamline their efficiencies. So I think the indirect impact of people like Zipcar or Tesla in, in, in many cases is even higher than their own direct so environmental impact. I think the you need both. Instigator to Definitely. the big companies to Definitely. change their mind. They kick them left and right and keep them moving. Yeah. Right. But it's not maybe the car of Tesla that is the biggest it's innovation. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that. I, 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 but if you look at it, it's. By the way, he drove the first Tesla sports car in Norway, just to demonstrate. <laughs> so. I've been working with Tesla for a long time. And uh, if you say it's 6,000 Teslas, it's more in, in Oslo now. But that represents an energy storage of around 500 megawatt hours. After 10 years, these batteries will be written off. And they can be reused for bat backup storage of solar and wind for the next 20 years before you go in and do material recycling. That's the biggest revolution with Tesla, not the car itself. And it, and it takes a vision to see the potential. When I met the Tesla guys um, when they first started the company. I was living in Los Angeles. Some of the original engineers were in Los Angeles and they said, do you want to get involved in this project? And I was just selling my tech company and I thought, wow, this is really fascinating technology. And their first business model was about selling the most expensive $100,000 sports car to really rich people. Uh -oh. And I thought, okay, is this, uh, you know, <laughs> is this something I want to go for? But the guys who were behind it, these engineers were like, yeah, but it's all about the batteries. It's all about changing the storage perspective. And I passed on this stupid me. Sometimes you pass on these things. Um, but, you know, that vision was um, if you had just looked at the surface and said, what is this business that's selling you know, expensive cars to rich people? You wouldn't have really understood that this is like, you know, what do you do at the beginning mm. to be able to be given the permission then to go on and do the real impact that you're aiming to have? And so you have to look at all the different angles. But you have to take some risk. I mean, and take risk. I, I, I was an investor in Think, uh, was we? Mm -hmm. We started yeah. that and we know it was a great opportunity, but it didn't succeed. But uh, others do. And this is where they now. So you have, obvious. but this is the risk you have to take. You, as a impact investor, as a institution, see my institutional investor, you would say you have to take some of the risk, and you have to calculate that maybe one out of five, or maybe one out of ten, is the only really big success. That is obviously where you need the return you expect, and that's where we have to find models. Can somebody share that? Do we have any first loss arrangement by governments to helping us getting going? I, I think that's so different in, in the different issues. Yeah. Well, first I, I just have to excuse him. He had before the Tesla sports car, he was the very first driving an electric car in Norway, fully <laughs> illegally and changed the attitude. So <laughs> your excuse for the Tesla. Yeah. Uh, but this is when we look at it from the investment point of view here, we need to do a lot more energy production in developing countries with labor intensive energy production instead of capital and material intensive energy production in the rich countries. And of course, what we are doing with the Sahara Forest project is quite cool. We, we have the test now from Qatar. We are producing food in Qatar to half the price of what they're importing food. We do it by seawater and revegetating the, the desert at the same time. Now we're building in Jordan. It's not easy circumstances. And where it's mostly needed is in Qatar and the present in Egypt, where we really could make a difference, yeah? So the traditional ways of getting some backing from the government, that's tons of paper, honestly. You, you don't do it. And, and you refer to that you need the governmental money for startup. We have gone away from that. We have, we have just started to work instead because you only get good at filling out papers. <laughs> but
but but what we have done with the Sahara Forest Project should shortcut some of the problem. Because if you invest in a solar park now in, in Middle East or in Africa, you need a contract with the grid operator. And that contract is not having a very big value. What we are, what we are doing is that we are enabling large-scale renewable establishment of solar and wind, and then we take out the products there in food, fresh water, revegetation, or biofuel, and then you have the whole world market. And that is, that is again, been a very missing link in the renewable energy sector that we don't manage to, to put, we use to say, we put symbiosis between biology and synergy between te technology. Uh, and you need to break through these long-term 20-year contracts all the time because we're working so hard to get them, we are going to build a solar plant, and then it has no value for the investors. We have to do it different. So we have to find other models. Susan. Well, speaking about other models, I'm working on my first project after being completely in the private arena. That's uh, funded by DFID, which is the Department for Aid in the UK, USAID, and the Nike Foundation. And it's a venture accelerator focused on accelerating companies that improve the lives of adolescent girls in poverty, starting in East Africa. And um, this is a project which has come from a perspective of we're doing all this work in development, we're spending all of this money in philanthropy, maybe it's time to really fund private sector solutions to some of these challenges. Or can we unlock business models that really positively affect the lives of girls in poverty, helping them learn, earn, save, protect themselves? And this is a really unusual collaboration, since we're here at Partnering for Change, a partnership between NGOs, DFIs, private investors, philanthropy, um, and entrepreneurial community to come together to say, maybe no one actor is gonna really be able to solve this, but if we all come together and really fuel this entrepreneurial talent with a, a specific objective, a specific set of measures and impacts that we're aiming for, that we can unlock some potential. And it's very high risk, but you've got DFID and USAID willing to take some part of that risk. So if I ask everybody to make a 30 second summary, how do we get the partnership idea? Because you emphasize that because your partnership of change, how can we get the partnership model involved in scaling up investments? We start well, over there and we go around. You have the last word. Yeah, I, I think no, uh, one, one of the m um, the main things here is just to, as Bjorn Haugland mentioned here earlier today, we, ha we have an, another, it's another environment around us. So much more sharing, so much faster spreading of information and knowledge throughout the globe. And I think also a more collaborative attitude among, among people both in business and in the, in the civil society and also on the, on the, on the, among politicians and, in, and, 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 and uh, on that side. So, I think just to, to keep on trying to, to establish new arenas, discuss all the time, exchange views, uh, use social media, that kind of uh, so tools. So pressure the government to become a partner in yeah. it? Is that the way you would do it, um, Frederick? Uh, to press the government. He used to climb ch chimneys in the old days. You know, <laughs> no, we have done a lot of work with the Norwegian Oil Pension Fund. And some of it's been good. Uh, at least we have got more transparency. I think very much of this has to come from the bottom up. You mentioned building solar panels uh, in, in Germany, France. It's not the big utilities that are investing a lot. It's a lot of small private investors. And now they have invested in solar panel. Soon they can invest in the battery and soon it's five times cheaper to charge your car than fill it with gasoline. That kind of investment will come from the bottom. But then 500 million hectares need to be revegetated uh, re again. That needs to be other kind of money. Uh, and, and, and I think we're, do, we're going towards Paris now. And before the Copenhagen negotiations, we had some high-level meetings with the climate people, Lord Stern, and. Uh, different investors, and we said, okay, if you don't get a, a global deal, what we do then? We need a kind of coalition of willing. And then that ended up in something called Clean Air Climate Coalition that got a very central role. 
uh, at the UN meeting now, a lot of companies went and made commitments. But today they can pay the, the emission trading system. Why don't we look if we could make an international bank that we pay in the ETS money to, mm -hmm. but if you fulfill your commitment, that goes in as a share in the bank instead, because commitments are no use if there is not any economic. And if you look at that, you could build an enormous investment bank for the people who want to do something. And I think that, that this probably could be one of the most important ways to, to look how, if there's 10 countries in Paris says, oh, we are not willing to do it. We have to find another model. So you really talk about real institutional change in addition if we are, to if we are going getting to the bottom-up uh, sector. But if we are going to get, get the investment for reforestation exactly. and yeah. for all the carbon capture and storage and so on, we need to think this way. It's not the technology. We need better technology. But yeah. it's the financing that's the problem. But we still need the entrepreneurs to kind of... Uh, we need everything. And that's where <laughs> I think where Tonic and others can play a key role, correct? So, yeah, I, to, to, to resume, I think that collaboration is absolutely key. Um, and it's true that the private investors are there for the early stage deals and are there to support the crazy ideas we were talking about um, earlier. But um, w in order for, for, for it to work, I think it's best to collaborate with government but, and also to collaborate with corporates. Um, to, so that, because they bring also crucial expertise that private investors cannot always bring. So I think the collaboration between um, the private investors who are used to early stage deals and the corporates or the government who are used to, um, who understand how a deal can scale yeah. is very important. The three so elements, the small enterprise supporters, the big money, the pension fund and the government. Yeah. Do you agree? Well, I would say we need to and have the opportunity to use the tool of social movement building, since I know a lot of people here are interested in that, to really say to every investor, wherever they're playing on the spectrum, whether they're a small individual investor or a big investor, what is the role that they can play? Can they be part of the divest invest movement? Can they be part of crowdfunding? Can they be part of incentivizing the pension fund that they are paying their money into by using their shareholder activism um, to and really making noise, um, grassroots organizing combined with um, where we're using our money. And so I think that's, the, that's the way we make change. The people sitting here who have their pensions, they should say to the pension fund, you have requirements. If you give pension money to this guy, it has to fulfill some requirements. Yeah, every single one of us has a voice and we need a to voice. be using it. Yeah, I think, yeah. I mean, for me, the good news is uh, no surprise. Um, we all have a common goal. We'd like to have the capital move in the right direction and have a positive impact. And one can move capital either by a stick or by a carrot. And I'm rather skeptical on the stick uh, because we're living in a global environment. The capital moves to other places or somehow escapes the stick. I, I think one has to provide the carrot and the most effective carrot for, for capital we think we've seen is, is positive financial returns. So, so I, I think... the idea of the carrot, I would like to thank the whole panel yeah. for creating this excellent uh, music around that here. I'm happy as a conductor. I thank you very much and please give an applause to our panel.